Um, good afternoon. So today I obviously have um, Finance Minister Bill English with me. We're going to talk about the government's response uh, to the Productivity Commission's report on housing affordability. Um, so I'll make a few comments, and Bill will make some comments, and take any questions you have on that, then when we'll draw, we'll move on to the other things. Uh, the government is today announcing that it will adopt almost all of the Productivity Commission's recommendations to improve housing affordability. You will remember that the government asked the Commission to conduct an inquiry into housing affordability, partly in response to growing concern that getting on the first rung of the home ownership ladder was proving too high a stretch for far too many New Zealanders. Affordability is also an important issue for the wider economy. The direction we are announcing today is part of the government's commitment to build a more competitive economy based on more savings, productive investments and exports with less spending on debt and housing. These are deep-seated and complex uh, reasons why New Zealand's housing market is not as efficient as it could be. Uh, because of that, there will be no quick fixes. Even if there were, I don't think New Zealanders who own their own homes would thank us if we took actions overnight which devalued their most valuable asset. But it is important for New Zealand households and communities as well as for the wider economy that we don't simply say we can't do anything about this. We can do something, but it will be slow and complex work. In saying that, I would note one important point. This is not a job for central government alone. Central government does not control most of the levers to do with housing. Local government has a critical role to play here. That needs to be acknowledged so that we can get together, make progress on this very vital issue. Our advice is that there are things we can do to make houses more affordable, and our intention is to get on with it. So I'll hand over now to Bill, um, then we'll take any questions, then we'll go. As the Prime Minister said, for most New Zealanders, a house is the single biggest, biggest asset they'll ever own. On current trends, fewer New Zealanders will own their own home. Home ownership peaked at 75% in the early 1990s and is now around 65%. Uh, that's the average for the OECD, but the trend for us is uh, unmistakably down. Our housing costs are too high and they are built in at many stages of the process starting with too little land being available. As costs are added on to housing, the chances of middle and lower income people owning their own homes recede. Uh, we believe that is not fair. The government agrees with the Productivity Commission that houses can be made more affordable and we intend to work with councils to make that happen. We don't accept that the only way for many New Zealanders to own a home is to be trapped with a huge burden of debt. New Zealanders, including those who pay rent, pay for the high cost of housing in a variety of ways. The most obvious is that most households need to borrow extensively to buy a home. And the Reserve Bank puts current household debt at $188 billion. That has three very serious implications, all of which make our economy more vulnerable than it otherwise would be. One is that money spent on large mortgages or rents limits the amount that householders can invest, if indeed they can invest anything at all, in other areas. Secondly, New Zealand's very high levels of private sector borrowing rank us along European countries in our overall indebtedness. Uh, and thirdly, high housing costs expose taxpayers to increasing demands for state assistance. For example, the subsidy for income-related rents for housing court tenants currently costs $589 million a year to the taxpayer. This is forecast to rise 30% in the next four years to reach nearly $800 million by 2015-16. Uh, similarly, we've seen a forecast that the accommodation supplement on which we currently spend $1.2 billion a year, will rise 9% or an extra $100 million over the next four years. Uh, so in total we're looking at an extra $300 million per year in four years' time that the taxpayers will be spending assisting people with their housing costs. And this is in addition to the demand for provision of more state houses. The housing market supply is simply not as responsive as it could or should be. 
In its report, the Commission identified four key problems and the Government agrees with that analysis. Those areas are land supply, costs and delays of regulatory processes, timely provision of infrastructure to support new housing, and the cost and productivity in the construction sector. Today we're announcing a work programme across a broad front that includes working with local government to increase land supply, increase appropriate densification within cities, improve the timely provision of infrastructure, and reduce the delays and costs of RMA processes associated with housing. Taken together, over time we expect this work will restrain house prices in the medium term without unreasonably compromising other objectives such as a better environment or local decision making. Now, the government has already been working in a variety of ways to reduce the costs and complexities that hinder development. For example, my colleague uh, Environment Minister Amy Adams has already announced a streamlined process for the first Auckland Unitary Plan and is signalling today more resource management reform relevant to housing. The Cabinet has also agreed on more direction in social housing, uh, which my colleague, uh, Housing Minister Phil Heatley, uh, has advised you about. It is important to note that the housing market is not something the Government controls directly. Uh, and also, in many areas, the Productivity Commission's report highlighted problems without proposing specific solutions. But I can tell you that as a priority, we will explore how we provide greater direction to local government about increasing land supply because it is inconsistent that a country with such a low population density as New Zealand should also have such expensive residential sections. We will also consider ways to reduce costs, delays and uncertainty around consenting. For example, could building consent authorities be amalgamated into regional hubs or even a national hub? We will look at alternative ways to fund and manage infrastructure for, for residential subdivisions. We are reviewing the development contribution system that was set in train a number of months ago. And more advice will be sought on the specific challenges facing the Auckland and Christchurch housing markets. And can I acknowledge the work of the Auckland and Christchurch councils uh, in working with government officials to assist the government in understanding uh, more of the detail and complexity of the planning process uh, and also their growing commitment to uh, enabling affordable housing. Can I stress that none of the measures uh, we will be investigating can fix the problem overnight. They require work across quite a complex areas across multiple government, local government and developer agents. But over time we're confident that the housing market can be expanded to embrace, not exclude, more people who aspire to home ownership. Thank you. This sounds like a gigantic talk piece that you're organising instead of doing something about affordable housing. Did you consider either low interest loans or options of land where where we, we where land, the land developers didn't take such great profits, super profits out of out of subdivision? Well, we, we're not looking at low interest loans. We're trying to deal with the problem much earlier in the pipeline. Why not? That is with I mean, home start loans obviously have a great tradition in New Zealand. Three percent loans, or even when I was a kid, they still had three percent loans. Um, yeah, well, Three percent um, loans at the moment are that would be more expensive than mortgage rates in America and England. Yeah, the five percent loans. But the, the risk with those measures, including rental subsidies, on which we currently spend close to two billion dollars, is that it's masking an underlying problem. We we agree with the Productivity Commission, who diagnosed a problem right at the start of the pipeline, and that is that the supply of housing is not responsive to the demand. So if demand is rising, we want to see supply of housing responding to that reasonably quickly uh, so that prices don't keep rising, which is what locks a lot of people out. So Bob the Builder, who's one of your former MPs, has said that people are making super profits in Tauranga at the expense of people who would like to be able to afford to buy homes. And he thinks that you can do an overnight change to the way in which we manage these things, which would have an immediate effect. Well, we're keen to hear what that, over, what that overnight change would be. I mean, we, we, we want to work... He proposed it. He, he, he submitted on it. Well, we don't necessarily agree with all of the submission. Uh, but look, we, we've got to work with councils 
through this because they are the um, current decision makers. We uh, want to be clear with councils that the government <coughs> uh, is keen to see plans that focus on, on making housing affordable. Uh, so, for instance, we've been in detailed discussions with the Auckland Council. Uh, you may be aware they've announced they're going to publish an affordable housing strategy, which uh, we believe is a very big step forward. In the case of Christchurch, where we've got thousands of cashed up buyers, uh, we, need, we want to work closely with the council there to ensure that... Well, in um, this is this another great example. In Christchurch, it's been repeatedly suggested to you that the government should open up large tracts of land and create essentially subsidised sections without allowing the existing landowners and the decision-making authorities to essentially grant lottery millionaires tickets to a bunch of people I mean, who presumably will donate to the National Party. Uh, well, actually, they don't like us doing this sort of stuff. Well, no, uh, people are doing that, don't. No, they don't like so, that. look, in Christchurch, we've got a bit of a real-time experiment, so you may be aware uh, the Ministry for Earthquake Recovery is currently being taken to court by developers, uh, partly because he has set, set off the, exactly down that path, and that is to make a much much more land available so that developers can't strangle the supply and therefore profit more than they should. On the other hand, development has to be profitable or it just doesn't happen. And we need a better understanding between councils and developers about what kind of rules need to be in place to ensure that it's worthwhile building particularly lower value housing. One of the messages in the last few months from the developer community is that, for instance, in Auckland you can't really afford to build a house that's worth less than 600000 uh, because the way the planning rules work, you can't make any money on something that's of lower value. This is just another example of the complexity of the issue. So we need to get the development community, uh, the councils and government and banks uh, approaching this with a view to maximising affordable housing rather than just pursuing their own interest. And the government's signalling pretty clearly that's how we expect them to behave uh, and we want to develop with them the tools to ensure that we can achieve it. You, what you talk about food. restraining prices, uh, Mr English. What, when you say restraining prices, do you mean that you want to sort of slow the steady growth or you want to pull them back? I mean, what's your aim? Do you have a target in mind? We don't have a particular target because we've still yet to establish, uh, you know, which tools are going to be effective. Uh, but you know, we've got a, <coughs> our levels of our house prices rose very rapidly. Uh, they've stabilised. That looks to be, in, in real terms, are actually dropping back a bit, as uh, because as house prices stabilised. Uh, and we, we can't see any measures that are going to have a dramatic impact on the housing market, but. While prices are stable, there's an opportunity for us to change the supply side, change the supply processes, so that we don't go into another big house price cycle. And what's Lee Brown said to you about that supply side? Well, we've had very constructive discussions with Auckland City. I think they 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 um, he, he certainly committed to uh, the idea that we need a broader supply of housing, particularly for middle and low income New Zealanders, so that they can access uh, home ownership. Uh, I think there's, a, there's still a lot of work to do to understand exactly how the detail of the planning process has, has a big impact on, uh, on how new housing comes to the market. You know, some very low level detailed decisions about building heights, for instance, can have quite a big impact right across Auckland about how much dense, uh, moderate density housing you can build. Uh, and we all need to understand those rules so that we can then change them. What guarantees can be made that speeding up the consenting process won't lead to quality control problems in the track? Uh, well, you have to do both things at once. So Morris Williamson's been doing a very thorough job of the re-regulation of the building industry uh, and now trying to standardise that regulation so we can lower costs. So that works well underway and that gives us the confidence that we can uh, move, take the step which Amy Adams is announcing today that in the next <coughs> RMA bill, uh, medium-sized consents will have a time limit of six months, and medium-sized consents look like, uh, it's still a bit unclear, but look like it would cover any subdivision over 20 or 30 houses. So you're confident that speed of process wouldn't compromise bill quality? 
Uh, yes, I am confident. I mean, at the moment, the slowness of the process is le leaving homeowners having to face large costs that are built in by banks and developers to cover delays. If we can reduce those delays, we can reduce the cost of housing, the same standard of housing, uh, to the home buyer. It seems like a lot of the big issues are going to be tackled by an ongoing work program for reform. I mean, when can we expect to see that happen? Because, you know, you talk about planning systems, planning practices, unlocking development capacities, all, all to be tackled by an ongoing program. When's that going to be? Well, so some of that is underway. Um, for instance, the re-regulation of the building industry and, and standardising the consent processes. That work has been in discussion with local authorities all year. Uh, some of it has been started more recently, so the decision to streamline the Auckland plan is one of the more critical planning decisions for New Zealand for the next five years, uh, and that was announced just last week, and that will enable a much shorter period over which the new plan for Auckland, which is you know, a third of the population, uh, will be able to take account of housing affordability, and the council's going to be publishing its housing affordability strategy. So that's all lining up pretty well. Then there'll be a series of new announcements. And, um, over, over what time? There's been, well, there's been one today about the medium-sized consents. Uh, and over the next six to nine months, uh, the government has got uh, the government's got reform of the Resource Management Act and the Local Government Act already in stream. Uh, so we'll be looking to make decisions. You know, and actually, over the next few months, we'll start making more of those decisions. And they'll, be in, so take, they'll be in that legislation. It will still take nine months until we know the full response to the report. Uh, yeah, that's right. So yes. what, did, what did the government think about the? headline recommendation for the immediate release of land on the outskirts of Auckland and Christchurch? Well, we've, in, the, in the case of Christchurch, that's been done. Uh, it's run into some legal, um, running across some legal hurdles, but uh, we Which you are, could legislate over, sure. That's, we, well, we are very keen to see housing affordability, with housing being affordable in Christchurch, particularly for those people who've been shifted out of lower value areas, have their insurance settlements, uh, who need to be able to afford to rebuild uh, elsewhere at reasonable cost. So we do have a working experiment there, and everyone needs to be clear, the government wants to achieve affordable housing in Christchurch. Uh, and in Auckland, we have the opportunity with their, with their plan. So look, the, in each case, making progress in, involves getting about 15 things moving at once. Uh, because you're looking at such a complex set of decisions and decision makers, banks, developers, <coughs> uh, infrastructure companies, councils, and even within councils they've got conflicting objectives to do with local politics and environmental impact and so on. So, so if councils effectively got nine months to do what the government wants to see them do, I mean, what if, what if they don't provide more land on the outskirts of the cities? What, what are you going to do then? Well, look, what we found in our discussions with them, uh, whatever they used to think, uh, they are increasingly focused on affordable housing. If they were to ignore the government's um, objectives, then we'd be looking to exert a bit more control over their planning process. Well, can we say over the last 10 years they have been ignoring housing affordability objectives, so why not just legislate to, to make them or, or put it in the hands of central government or take it out of their hands? Because you're leaving it in their hands, and they're part of, they have been part of the problem. Uh, we prefer to work with them if possible because they've got a local mandate uh, and a much better understanding of their local their local area. But we, we want to assist them with that. So, for instance, we're going to do a detailed suburb by suburb study in Auckland, to which no one has actually done before, uh, to establish exactly what's happening and get a detailed level of what impact the planning decisions are having on supply suburb by suburb. Because at the moment there's a lot of generalisations about it. Um, so that's the kind of constructive way we'd like to work with councils. But they should be clear today that the government is determined to see housing affordability improve. Uh, there hasn't been a focus of their plans in the past. Um, we want to see it as a focus of their plans in the future. So, so what, what, about, what about developers? Because it's still in developers' commercial interest to hold land back so they can maximise profit. What do you do well, that, that is a, that, that's another uh, reasonable issue. Uh, to some extent, it's a matter of create. If you create enough opportunities, they have to develop. Because if they hold back, 
someone else is going to build. It's just like any other market. There's more and more supply. Uh, you, you know, they can't sit on their sections. Um, there's also been propositions from some councils about putting covenants on them about the release of land. Uh, we are going to get to test test some of these theories in Christchurch um, because they would. The, the idea of expanding supply fairly rapidly is actually not one that councils have used, so people don't really understand all the implications of it, nor do we. Uh, for instance, you could make a whole lot of sections available, but um, if the council says we can't afford any of the infrastructure, well, no one can build a house. So you've got to solve the avail problem of availability of land, uh, including the availability of op opportunities for moderate density within cities, and you've got to coordinate that with the infrastructure. Uh, and councils, to be fair to them, have you know, that's big costs for them. So that's why we've got to work with them about how how um, how you can bring these things together more efficiently. Just so we're clear, um, if councils don't move to help you in terms of freeing up land for for affordable houses, you will legislate to um, compel them to do that. Well, I wouldn't look at. All I'm saying is uh, that, from the, I think, this, from the government's point of view, affordable housing is really important. Uh, it impacts directly on the government and on the economy, and we'd like to work with them so that the larger interest is clear to them. And uh, we're also making it pretty clear that, I think, on behalf of the community, actually, that we, if, if we can make housing more affordable just by changing the rules, then why wouldn't you? You'd have less New Zealand families worried about whether their offspring are going to be able to And changing out. the rules you're talking about local government act? Uh, yes, we would expect to see changes in the Resource Management Act and the Local Government Act that, that uh, you know, well informed changes that will promote more affordable housing. So are you, are you looking at any sort of uh, uh, cap on, on what um, councils can levy developers? Well, there's, there's study. Uh, a couple of studies going on right now about development contributions because the policies are inconsistent across the country. Um, councils have been trying to deal with the problem of how to fund infrastructure in the subdivisions. Um, so we understand the problem, but the solution they're using at the moment, in some cases, is a significant barrier to reasonably priced housing. Uh, so we'll get the results of those um, reviews uh, pretty soon. Uh, both development contributions themselves and infrastructure and local government. Those things were set up about six months ago and they'll be incorporated into the work program over the next six months, or well, into the decisions we, over the next six months. Can we anticipate an SOP on the local government bill which is being considered? I mean, are we expecting legislative changes to be made as a result of this policy process that we're starting? Well, there will be legislative changes, but I couldn't comment in detail on whether it will be that particular amendment bill that's in the select committee right now it might be a bit late for that, but um, we'll see the have you, have changes. You, have you considered reaching across the, the House to your opposition? Because they obviously have strong views on this too and are very very keen to see progress made in affordable housing. Yeah, they tend to focus... Uh, no, look, we haven't approached them about making the policy. Um, they, tend, like, uh, they tend to focus on subsidising the rents and the mortgages. Okay, well, we've already got $2 billion worth of subsidy there, uh, and it's going to grow by $300 million over the next few years. We want to focus on making on the plan, planning and resource management processes right at the start of the pipeline. But so if they want to support us on that, they're most welcome to. But it doesn't seem to be much comfort for young families struggling either with high rents or to purchase their own home. I mean, you're saying trust us that it's going to happen eventually. I mean, what can they take from well, for the first time, I've got a government uh, clearly articulating that it wants uh, to make sure the housing market's working properly, and we want to attack the disease rather than the symptoms. Uh, secondly, they have got the lowest interest rates we've had in 40 years, uh, and government support for those families continues to increase. We've just increased working for families payments on the 1st of April by 5% uh, this year. So, but it will take a while to work through the planning system. I think how they can help us is make their views clear to their council um, and their councillors that they want to see sensible decisions that are going to allow young families to be able to afford homes. How long do you expect those changes to come from? Well, we'll be making decisions over the next six to nine months. Um, 
and we would expect that to flow into, into plans, but just to give you a sense of the scale, um, uh, most major uh, uh, district plans took 10 years to become operative, and a lot of the changes take three to five years. The one plan for Auckland, we um, are going to, we've made a decision that that will all be done in three years. So it could be, you know, one to three years before the significant changes in the planning, close to two to three years before the significant changes uh, in the planning processes. Um, if we think, you know, we do, we do always have the option of some legislative change from Parliament, but, you know, we, want, we would want to be uh, careful about cutting across the mandate and the knowledge of local councils. But so, so, so before we start seeing some of these new subdivisions, are you saying that, that, you, that Auckland is, is the problem, is that Auckland is looking to buy a house and uh, finding it unaffordable may not see anything for three years? Well, look, the, the subdivisions in the pipeline, yeah. although they do fall well short of what looks like the likely demand, uh, the government is becoming a significant developer. We've got something like 1,500 houses uh, in the pipeline uh, in Auckland and Christchurch, but mostly in Auckland, because the government is the largest landowner within Auckland. Uh, and probably the front end of that is Hobsonville and Tamaki. Uh, and there's, you know, there should be more of that done um, in order to uh, meet the demand within the city. So how long so are you talking for three years? Well, look, I wouldn't want to prejudge it. That's as much a question for the councils as it is for us. I mean, Auckland are telling us they've got plenty of sections out there uh, to meet the demand. The market signals are that that's not necessarily the case. So we, you know, we've been pretty careful about not not charging in where we don't have a lot of detailed knowledge. And I had to say up to five or six months ago, government officials, even four months ago, government officials didn't, four ministers didn't know a lot about how all these processes work. Uh, on the other hand, I think the Councils can appreciate that for a lot of New Zealanders, this this matters. Have, have you considered um, the loan side of it, like putting on, you know, eighty percent loan value restrictions, or doing anything along those lines to try and well, the prices? Look, the, the irony is that um, you know, pe when people are, well, this is why we want to attack the problem right at the start, right at the start of the pipeline, because what would there's a temptation that if the house prices start picking up. We start, you know, the Reserve Bank, for instance, starts setting loan to value ratios, which would restrict the capacity of lower income families to get into housing. Not because they didn't have a big enough deposit. Not so, if you introduce some kind so of we don't to, So you know, we, we don't think that's a useful way to deal with the house price cycle once it's got going. We'd rather get it now while prices are relatively stable and deal with the supply issue so that we don't get such a big price cycle later. Have you had, have you had any advice on the Commission highlighted about the What about the issue the Productivity Commission highlighted about the building industry itself, its low productivity, its cottage industry structure? Uh, is there anything you can do about that? Yeah, there, there are, there's a number of, quite a lot of action already in train. One is um, standardising the consenting processes because the, the industry tells us one reason we have a lot of mostly non-standard houses is you've got 78 local bodies with different rules. Uh, and Morris Williamson has done um, put a lot of work into improving the building consent, uh, the building consent process. The industry itself has set up its own alliance to look at its productivity problems, um, and they've gone along with for instance, upgrading the qualifications and skills of your workforce is one way of improving, uh, improving productivity. Uh, we're also interested in looking at the cost structure of the industry itself. Um, and so one of the issues we'll be considering over the next few months is what's called a market level study uh, of the construction supply industry. Would you expect that we'll look at uh, things including Fletcher's dominance of the construction and building materials market? I think if you look at the building materials markets, it's pretty hard not to look at Fletcher's. So why not get the Commerce Commission to look at that? Uh, well, the Commerce Commission has dealt with these issues at different stages um, and clearly come to, to, to a view that from their point of view there isn't, there isn't a problem. We wouldn't want to you know, prejudge that there's a problem, but look, it's, it gets raised by everybody and it's part of the comprehensive approach to housing affordability. 
uh, we're probably best to be better informed about how whether those markets are weak. And weak. And we did a we did a re, sort of a formalised review of the electricity market a couple of years ago, and the result of that is, as a result of that review, it, the market is now quite a bit more competitive, and maybe that's possible in the building industry. I don't know. I just wonder how much of a systemic risk there is with the amount. Of, you mentioned how high the mortgages were. Um, how much of a systemic risk do, do high home prices place on the New Zealand economy? Well, in the last economic cycle through the 2000s, they've been they have generated our biggest single risk, which is our the vulnerability of New Zealand to overseas lenders. We're one of the most indebted private se household sectors uh, in the developed world, and that's. Well, we need to learn a lesson from that, um, and while also that's why now, while we have the opportunity in a relatively calm market, uh, we want to attack some of these issues uh, because New Zealanders are highly motivated about home ownership, and they will commit to quite large amounts of debt if that's what it takes. And that's you know, if it's more than necessary, it's diverting resources from other more productive investments. Mr. English, you just said a relatively calm market, and in your preamble, you said that it was stable doesn't seem very stable. The open property market, according to the newspapers, is going gangbusters. It's hot. Yeah, it's well, there's, there's, yeah, um, look, there's some price rises in some parts of that market. Um, we're told by the Auckland Council that um, that's pretty much in the core core area of Auckland. Out on the periphery, the prices aren't moving much at all. Uh, even if you think that is the case, it just points to more urgency to get on with the decisions over the next six to nine months. But on on the social housing been? front, um, where's the logic in letting um, Housing New Zealand transfer properties to these community housing um, organisations? Because how does that grow supply? Uh, we believe, <coughs> look, this is a process that's been ongoing for two or three years with the community housing sector. We all have to say, I think we're going too slowly for them. Uh, the, the idea there is that um, the Housing Corp has been a large monopoly supplier. Uh, it doesn't necessarily manage its stock well uh, and it's completely dependent on government for funding. These third party uh, providers uh, have access to other sources of funding. Um, they tend to be a bit more specialised and they certainly want to have the opportunity to house more people in need and they're just more flexible experience about how they can do that. Why don't you just give them the money rather than take um, property off, off Housing New Zealand? Uh, well, look, a lot of properties off... Look, Housing New Zealand say themselves that about a third of their properties are not suitable for their needs. And a third of their properties is something like fifteen to 20,000 houses. Uh, you know, we don't want to get this out of perspective. The Housing Corp has got almost 70,000 houses, 69,000 houses. I think the next biggest community provider has got a hundred. So we're not in danger of revolution here. Um, but look, we're, we're working with the sector. We're doing some experiments about transferring stock. Uh, and some of them are realising that the housing corp stock is of such low quality that it's not worth them taking it on. Uh, well, you know, that raises another question about whether we should own it either. Um, so you're going to see, you know, careful but continued change in social housing. We'll be saying more well, there's a review going on now of accommodation supplement and income-related rents. Uh, we're very conscious that this is cap. These are these are subsidies that are supporting the lowest income households in New Zealand. Uh, so we've got to be very careful about our changes to it. But again, the community housing sector uh, is telling us that some of those subsidies, that, that those subsidies could be used more effectively, uh, particularly to transition people into independence rather than trapping them uh, in a dependent situation, often in low quality housing. Uh, you know, like you saw the idea from the poverty expert group saying, uh, that maybe the government should have some requirements on the quality of housing before it gives out a subsidy. Um, so that's something that we'll look at. Okay. Thanks very much. <coughs> um, so just very quickly, in terms of the um, 
Royal Commission uh, into Pike River and revised that um, late afternoon tomorrow the Governor-General will receive the Royal Commission Inquiry's report into the Pike River Mine Tragedy. The report will then be delivered to the Attorney-General and officials and ministers will consider the report over the coming days. I, <coughs> me, I know that there will be a great deal of interest in the report, particularly from the families of the deceased men and the West Coast community. Once the Government has received the report, Cabinet will need to consider it. We intend to release the report first to the families and then to the public early next week. Uh, the Government's response to the report will be issued at the same time. Just in terms of ministerial activity, I'm here in Wellington today and tomorrow at <coughs> the Auckland on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday in Dunedin. Prime Minister, um, we now know that the SIS were advised in October 2010 about this. So Warren Tucker at that point um, told them that Kim.com wasn't a security threat. He told them to go and see the police, the FBI to go to the police. And he reported this. We, we're still expected to believe that neither Mr Ferguson nor Mr Tucker told anybody else in your office that this was being, that GCSB was in running the law in New Zealand? It just seems to lack all credulity. In your mind. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, it's not just in my mind. I think this 14 month period here, one of your agencies... Well, let me correct you where you're wrong then. Mr Tucker was not advised. SIS did the routine standard inquiry as is done when someone gets a residence class visa, wasn't actually handled by Mr Tucker, it was very much an operational matter. They went out, as they do to all other agencies that might have an interest, they came back with the responses that you're now aware of. One agency, the FBI, came back and said, while we don't have any particular information about Mr Dotcom, he might be a person of interest to us, that information was forwarded to um, the police, because, as you say, he's correctly pointed out, that wasn't their area of expertise. The police and other people investigating the do you expect to be interviewed or take part in any way in that investigation? Well, I think that sounds exactly right. I think they've, they've appointed some people to have a look at the issue, so they'll ultimately need to decide whether it's in their public interest. Look, if they wanted to talk to me, I'd be more than happy to talk to them, but whether it actually goes that far, we'll know. What would you have expected the SIS um, when they were doing the immigration check, yeah. during which the FBI said they wanted to conduct a joint investigation with the police? Yeah. Um, and the FBI, uh, sorry, the SIS passed that on to they were a mailbox, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then about two weeks later, though, then emailed the immigration service to say they had no security concerns about Mr. Com. Wouldn't it have made sense, though, for them to have raised with immigration, but by the way, the FBI are investigating? I mean, that seems... <coughs> No, I think it's one of these standard procedures. They do this all the time. They do about three or 4,000 a year. Nothing terribly unusual about it. When anyone ever applies for a residence class visa or in that category, then the, then the SIS conduct that. So they do a huge number of inquiries into lots of different people in lots of different categories. That was one of them. Um, it was handled at a pretty low level. As I say, they went out to the various agencies. When they came back and said, the FBI said this person may be of some interest to them, they went back to them and said, look, that's not really the area we're not the agency you're after, we we'll forward it on to the police and to the... Well, they didn't say maybe of interest, they said they wanted to do a joint investigation. <coughs> well, they, they, my understanding is they just forwarded it on to the police. Well, that's pretty unusual, though, for the FBI to be interested in an immigration case. I mean, as... as, as well, I can't confirm that, I don't know that's unusual. Okay, so the, que the question that I asked, though, was Mr Tucker, at some point, must have become aware of the fact that the GCSB is investigating a New Zealand resident. I, mean, um, I don't know when he knew that you have to take that. Well, could no. you please find out for us? Because I think that's a quite a relevant question. I mean, you're the responsible minister for the SIS and the GCSB. Well, Warren Tucker's responsible for the SIS. He's not responsible for the GCSB. No, but you are the responsible minister for the SIS and the GCSB. They, own, they both report only to you. It seems as though they're not talking to each other or somehow they don't... Well, these are completely different operations. I mean, the GCSB's involvement was at the request of Ofcans. SIS is part of the general basic procedures around getting a minister, getting a residence class. But the way this looks, Prime Minister, is that the FBI come to New Zealand, they ask the SIS business assistance, the SIS says, no, go to the police. The police then go to Ofcan to go to GCSB, and they end run our law and, and spy on a New Zealand resident. I would have thought that, that Warren Tucker might have been quite upset about that. Right, have you? Well, I can't take it up with him. He's, a, he's, he's, a, he's the, the director of the SIS. I mean, it's not like we can ask him questions. Could you? Could, Sorry, I'm going to have to wrap this up. Have you had any briefing on the um, suicide epidemic in Northland? 
And uh, look, I'm aware of the case uh, that Taliana Turia raised about the 10 year old boy, and I'm aware that there are issues up north and that there's been a potential cluster uh, in Northland, and the authorities have been working on that. I mean, I guess what I'd sort of say is that when um, I went away and looked at this whole issue as part of the Prime Ministerial response, if you like, to mental, uh, youth mental health issues, what we identified within the system was that there are clearly some gaps. And that was really what the $62 million that we applied to this area is trying to do, is to fill those gaps. I think what we know is that there's quite a bit we don't know about the system, we don't know what works perfectly. And some of the advice was I was involved in sort of detailed work there from specialists is that there are all sorts of reasons why young people take their own lives. But we certainly know proportionately a lot more of them are Maori boys. And we know that the likelihood of a young boy attempts to take his life probably than being successful is much greater than uh, uh, young girls who might try and commit suicide but generally aren't, you know, don't carry out the, the whole way. Um, I, mean, I possibly disagree with Tariana this morning when she said that, that um, youth um, mental health workers in schools wouldn't necessarily work. I mean, my view would be that our expectation, with good reason, would be that a 10-year-old boy would be at school, and that is at least a controlled environment we are a health worker would at least have access to that young person. Uh, but we are continuing to work in that situation. Just poverty and um, isolation um, uh, I think there's a wide range of theories about why people commit suicide. Um, I mean, certainly despondency and, and, and deprivation could be an issue. And there are certain characteristics that we can see that are similar, uh, but of itself, just being poor doesn't mean that someone will commit suicide. There's a range of reasons, and we see, you know, the, the children are very well off families also commit suicide, so it's, it's not as clear cut as that. Do cabinet making decisions about part six A, the point of relation there? We've considered the matter today, and I think the minister is going to be in a position to make an announcement about that fairly soon. Are you looking at limiting that to large work I don't want to. Speculate on that. All I can say is the minister is going to be in a position to say something. So. The latest, um, the latest IT privacy breach, yep. uh, the IOD this time. I mean, th there do seem to be some long-standing issues with the IDs, IT yep. systems. Uh, is there any sort of stepping up the urgency around those? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things here. I mean, firstly, IOD deal with 25 million contacts a year with New Zealanders. So from time to time, there will be issues. Secondly, their system, as we all know. Um, quite frankly, is a pig of the system. I mean, it's been around since 1991. They spend a billion dollars upgrading it, and it's got some issues. Um, one thing I would say, though, is I, you know, while there's been a spate of these in recent times, and um, while the government takes them seriously, and the chief executives take them seriously, if any of us think that this is a new phenomenon or a new problem, I think we're deluding ourselves. Quite frankly, there will have been these issues over the last 15 years. It's just that they've become the issue du jour at the moment, and so every breach gets uh, gets mentioned. Uh, I'm not condoning them, I'm just saying that you know, we deal with an organisation that has 40,000 people. Um, I, MSD alone have 1.1 million contacts with New Zealanders a year, ID has 25 million. There will be times where through human error they make a mistake, but the government's investing heavily in its systems, and it's certainly working hard to try and improve the level of service it provides. On a different note, Prime Minister, and close up they're doing a story tonight about the Oh, really? Do you think that's something um, that we need to look at here for some of our MPs or some of our senior um, people in the business world? Uh, are we sexist as a bunch of New Zealanders? I don't think so as a general rule. I mean, there are probably some isolated comments from time to time you can pick out and point to, which might indicate um, sort of sexist behaviour. But I think if you look at New Zealand for the most part, and we've got a very proud tradition of um, gender equality, I mean, we're the first country that gave women the vote. We've had you know, a woman prime minister for many other countries, including the United States. We've had women present here. Um, we've had women chief justice running our top companies, etc., etc. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there is certainly uh, a, you know, improvement to be done. I mean, if I still look at the amount of appointments of women to private sector boards, for instance, it's very low. And even with government boards, it's less than 50 per cent of improvement. So there's some work to be done, but are we a sexist bunch? Just on the Doha Morphi, um, Martin Weeks is yep. again asking you to get involved. Is there anything more you can do to come out of the 
Well, it's before the courts at the moment, so that matter is um, something that I wouldn't intervene even if it was in New Zealand. I'm not, I'm not ruling out intervening, but that really is the last card for me to play, not the first card for me to play. I still think it's best handled by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He's very close to the issue, and I say it's before the courts. If all other angles are exhausted, um, then it's something I'll turn my mind to and see whether I can add some value. But if I play that card now, I'm not sure that you help us to work. Thank you.